Welcome. It is the December 19th Relos Andes webinar. I am Rob O'Leary. I'm here with Lisa Wakefield and staff here at the United States Embassy. Deep inside the embassy in Lima, Peru, in a secret room doing this broadcast. And we have a special guest today, and I would like to introduce her in just a second as we move forward. Rachel, are you there? Yeah. Hi. Hi. Yes. Yeah. So our guest today, special guest from Panama, another United States ESL fellow. Her name is Rachel Diemer, and she is going to be telling you about five strategies to send your students to and through college. So this will be strategies for your classroom to help you be become a more organized, more focused teacher so your students can learn seamlessly. So a little bit about Rachel as we move forward. Uh, she is a tech Texas native and she's giving the old horns there. To Rachel, would that be A&M or is that uh, TU, Texas University? Oh, no. No, that's uh, UT <laughs> University. Okay, of University of Texas. <laughs> I always get that wrong. And you're giving the horns, if I, I see that correctly. And that is actually a symbol of what? Why do you do that? It's a symbol of my university, the University of Texas. And so just a hook of horn sign. Yeah. And so there's actually only two universities in Texas, I believe, a te Texas A&M and UT and nothing else, right? Is that correct? <laughs> um, you're actually incorrect with that, Rob. There's a lot. Oh, of I'm sorry. I thought there was no other institutions no. other than those two. <laughs> so, those are probably some of the most famous. Yeah. Ah, okay. So as you can see before she, uh, thank you for clarifying that. Uh, mm -hmm. Before moving to Panama, she was a teacher and instructional coach in Dallas, Texas. And she also has worked in the Caribbean, the Latin American states, and also a lot of her specializations, classroom management, which is a lot of what we'll be talking about today, behavior interventions, which is, is very important, CEOP training, planning and implementations, literacy development assessment, English oracy, and writing, and curriculum and, and instruction. I'm working on my speaking as well, so maybe you can help me, Rachel. So <laughs> that's a little bit about Rachel today, and she's going to kind of take it forward from here. Lisa and I will be kind of guiding her through. So go for it, please, and I will stop every once in a while when we do the polls, and I will interject from time to time, but it's all, all right. on you, Rachel. Go. Great. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining me today. I know it's a busy week, and so your time is very appreciative. Today, we're going to talk about some key strategies to help develop you and your teaching practice, as well as give your students the um, behaviors and the characters that will, they can take with them to and through college. So let's get started. Today, we're going to talk about the strategies of the teaching craft that can set your students up for lifelong success. We'll learn more about the techniques that will distinguish the good teachers from the great teachers and develop your teaching practice with concrete and specific and actionable strategies that you can immediately use in whatever classroom you teach in. So this uh, presentation will be available on the, not only mine, but also the Relo uh, Andy's Facebook page as well after the presentation. Before we get started, I wanna know a little bit about you. So what do you guys currently teach? Are you an elementary grade teacher, pre-K through fifth? Do you teach secondary grades, like sixth grade through eight? Are you an upper grades teacher, like ninth through 12? Are you not currently in a classroom now? Okay, well, we, we, we have our results here. As I can see, we have 59% uh, uh, are in the upper grades. Wow. 18% are in secondary grades. And uh, actually, the lowest percent is elementary school teachers, which I find very interesting. So upper grades seem to predominate. I was close with 90 something percent. It was almost 60. Wow. Right? Yeah. Well, the good thing about these strategies is that you can use them um, yes. in basically any classroom setting from pre-K to college. So um, it's great to know what everyone's teaching. So it doesn't matter what you're going to be teaching. These strategies are for all teachers. Absolutely. These are, these are strategies to develop not only um, your teaching style and your teaching craft, but um, you know they're more like mindsets and character developments as well for students. So uh, let's move forward, Rachel. Now that we know who we are talking to, so today we're going to talk about five key concepts that you can use immediately in your class. The first of these concepts is the concept of a hundred percent. When you're teaching, there's one acceptable percentages of students that are following directions, participating, and of course succeeding. That's 100%. So 
when you walk into your classroom, you want to have this mindset in mind so you can share this mindset with your students. When you, when you wiggle away from this 100%, your authority is subject to interpretation, situation, and motivation. And this is going to cause a breakdown in your classroom. This works when you maximize your visibility. So you are moving around the classroom. You're seen looking at your students. You're, you're monitoring their work. You're monitoring what they're actually doing. And you don't avoid, you avoid the, you avoid little things, right? So you don't, ha you don't let kids just slide by or marginal compliance. You, and you leverage these opportunities for behavior opportunities. And so, you want 100% of your students doing what they're supposed to do 100% of the time. Let's see how this teacher uses it in his classroom. So before we go, Rich, so does that mean, is that for everything that you do in the classroom? Uh, I, is it yes. for giving, when you're giving directions or when students are doing an assignment? What does that mean 100% for everything? So 100% would go for everything. You want 100% attendance. If students aren't attending your class, you want to make phone calls. You want 100% participation. You can, we'll talk about different ways to do this later, but you want to make sure that 100% of your students are being taught and 100% of your students are learning. This is so a mind if, go yep. ahead. So if you're giving directions and one student is looking out the window, that's, even that's 99%, that's you don't 99%. want that. Absolutely not, because that student's missing something. You want 100% of your students participating and learning 100% of the time. This is something that they can take with them when they become adults. Whenever they get jobs, whenever they go to university, you don't want them giving 80% of themselves, right? You want them mm -hmm. giving 100% of themselves. Um, this will build not only their, um, their ethic, you know, like their work ethic and their ability, but it also builds their character. Let's see it in action. Okay, so Rachel, we're, it's, it looks like it's a little slow. Can you tell me as we're waiting for the sound, what's, what might be happening here? Yeah, so this particular teacher is working with middle school students and he's going over um, multiplication. And so he's expecting all of his students to be participating physically and um, with the activity. And so right now, if you notice, He's expecting all of his students to participate in this call in the multiplication chant and with the call and responses. Mm -hmm. So even when he's giving directions, what, are, what is he telling all the students they should be doing? He's talking about a technique called slant, which we'll discuss later, but he's expecting 100% of his students to participate in this uh, behavior. Okay. Very good. We'll work on the audio, but we can talk it through. So he, even when he's giving directions, he wants all students looking at him. Yeah, and so you can see that right now. He's waiting for um, his students to listen to for the next assignment for the homework. And if they're not listening, are, are we going to learn a little bit more later about how a teacher can get a student's attention? Um, yes, absolutely. And so. Okay, great. If they're not listening, there's definitely ways that you can do to encourage their um, participation and to encourage them to be listening. So let's talk right. about this. What does this look like for teachers? You as a teacher, you set the standard, not a goal of 100%. So whether it's compliance with directions or academic, it's a culture of positivity. The most sustainable form of compliance is one for both the teacher and the student for achievement, not teacher power. So this is all about students achieving, participating, being successful. It's not about them just mindlessly following you. Um, uh -huh. verbal, verbal ways to enact this in your class is 100% of us will get this concept. So that's positive, right? 100% of us are having eyes on the board. That's basically you know, telling your students that, hey, all of us are gonna learn, all of us can learn, all of us will learn. For this also for teachers it also looks and sounds like a least invasive form of intervention and so so often as teachers we get caught up with the um with wasting learning time 
with discipline, right? The best forms of discipline are, no, are non-invasive forms of intervention where students can keep their self-esteem and keep learning at the same time. So we're talking about nonverbals. We're talking about positive group correction, anonymous individual correction, private individual correction, quick, quick, quick but, public correction, it, and then consequence. Yeah. Sorry, uh, how, how could it be private if you're in a full classroom full of people then? So different ways to do this is, you've, first of all, you've got to know your students. And so whether it means that, you know, coming up beside them and teaching right beside them, that would be the first step, right? You want to get close. You want to be, uh, you want to be close to the student. You want to give them a chance to self-correct, you know, to stay face, as we say in English. Um, if that doesn't work, you want to move maybe to a whisper, right? You can go up and whisper whatever, you know, directions or whatever expectations in their ear. You can also pull them out and talk to them in a private area. Discipline isn't about making kids do what you want, but it's about building their character, right? You wanna make sure that kids can save their self-esteem and they can save you know, their reputation or whatever they have in the classroom, you know, their egos, as well as learn, instead of going into like a power struggle, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And so you do this by being calm, right? It's an exercise in purpose, not power, that you're modeling these things, right? And you're practicing these things until they're mastered. And so you don't just want to let things slide, like, oh, like the kid's not paying attention or they're not taking notes or whatever is going on in the classroom. Oh, maybe they'll get it, whatever. You don't have time to do it. You want to make sure that they're practicing and doing it again and again and again until they're successful. Excellent. For students, so what else do we have? Oh, sorry. Oh, for students, this is a habit that they're asked to do without thinking about, right? That they, that this isn't something that they think it, 100% isn't something that's an option for them, right? They learn how to do these things until they're doing them correctly. Um, that they're engaging in this, not because of teacher power, they're engaging because of their own achievement. They do it not to please the teacher, but to promote their own learning. So how do you think 100% will prepare your students for their futures? Uh, so, uh, Rachel, have you used this quite often in your classroom? Absolutely. Um, and my work as a, as a teacher has been in turnaround schools, so schools that need a critical amount of help and, and achievement, or they get closed by the state of Texas. And so this is a technique that is used in some of the most successful schools, not only in the United States, but around the world. And so, of course, that we've implemented this uh, strategy to be used in every um, classroom in the schools I've worked in. And it really builds mm -hmm. a culture of positivity with your students. And so it's a great way for them to know that, hey, they can learn, they can be successful. It's not a matter of doing what the teacher wants to do, but it's a matter of them being the best version of them they can be. Okay, so it's it's really self-directed. It's not yelling at the students. Absolutely it's not, not. It's getting them to do the things they need to do by being positive and using not yelling at them, but using hand signals, eye signals, things like that. Yeah, least invasive. So you want to save your voice. You know, you want to save all of your energy as teachers. This is a this is a uh, this can be a demanding job, and so you don't want to yell. You don't want to do all that you want to make sure that students are learning because they want to learn that students are successful because they want to be successful and so this is okay. more of an well, intrinsic strategy very good excellent this is not really a trick question i would say this is uh no. pretty straightforward uh let's see what people said it looked like most people said a and b no one actually said b so 100 percent is encourages all students to give their all and to students to focus on their personal academic sorry the words got cut off that would be achievement i'm guessing correct yeah yes so personal and academic achievement yeah okay very good so uh let's move forward and let's see we as we get going we still have some more time let's go on to the, some other uh slides and see what else is going on the next strategy we're going to talk about is slant. So these are the key behaviors that students need to be able to pay attention and be successful in an academic setting. So this slant is an acronym for sit up, listen, ask and answer questions, nod your head, and track the speaker. And so in the other video, we um, the teacher was asking his students to slant. I'm looking for slant. These are the behaviors that students need to pay attention. 
so often as teachers, we say, oh, I need you to pay attention. I need you to do this. I need you to do that. But oftentimes, students don't actually know what it means to actually pay attention. This acronym will help them be successful. Can you so tell us what it is again? What does that mean? What is so the slant again? One more time. Slant. slant is an acronym for sit up. So students are sitting up in their, in their chair. They're not slumped mm -hmm. over. They're listening. They ask and they answer questions. They nod their head and they track the speaker. And so what does that mean acronym, to track the speaker? So they're watching who's ever speaking. So whether it's another student, whether it's a teacher, who's ever speaking in the classroom, they're paying attention to them because their eyes are focused on that one person. It's kind of like a version of 100%, correct? It is used with 100%. Okay. So I like SLAN. I use SLAN a lot in my classrooms, especially um, in elementary school and high school, because you say pay attention and kids do not know what that means, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so you want to make sure that you're teaching kids exactly what you expect. Um, let's see what this looks like in this classroom. Great. So let's see slant in action. So again, the acronym set up, listen, ask into questions, nod your head, check the speaker. I think we've got a little slow bandwidth today, so we're going to have to be in, uh, we have to be patient. That's all right. And so this is done in a music classroom. All the kids sitting up straight, tracking the speaker, listening. Yeah, I think it's going to be a little slow, Rachel, today. So why don't we okay. just kind of like, as just kind of talk through, as just tell people what they should be looking at here, and then we can kind of move All right, forward. So we want to watch, how are the kids sitting in their desks? You see how all the kids are turned around because the child's speaking. Oh, so They're even if the speaker's speaker. not the teacher, they have to also look at, if it's a student, they have to look at the other student. Of course, or whoever's speaking in the classroom. Oh, okay. So you see I all understand. the kids sitting up straight. You see all the kids um, tracking the speaker. You also see this in a small group setting. Wow. Nodding. And they're kids, they're not gonna be perfect, you know, but you see them all doing their best with this behavior. Okay, excellent. I think this, I, I think that even though it's a little slow, I think both examples really did, or all three so far have shown right. very well so, what, what it's like. So let's talk about what this means uh, as a teacher. So for teachers, this looks and sounds like you using the acronym to remind students to be attentive and ready learners. This also serves as a nonverbal non-invasive signal allowing you to remind them without interrupting what you're teaching so i'm looking for slant or i see a hundred percent of this table in slant um or i'm waiting for you know a hundred percent of our classroom to be in slant before i go on mm. i've got for a question students? so, yeah, so if ahead. one student if uh, uh romero is is not in slant you, you don't just say romero get in slant absolutely not because you don't want you don't want the attention to be on negative behaviors. Okay. You want to spotlight positive behaviors. So okay. if you, for example, if he has a neighbor that's, that's sitting up straight and being in slant correctly, you could do a shout out like, oh, I really like how so-and-so is in slant and ready to learn. Okay, um, great. And, and so, and especially like proximity and praise. So you want to make sure that you get close to the students that aren't displaying these behaviors. And you want to make sure that you praise the students for doing the right things instead of highlighting all the wrong things. Okay. It saves a lot of time and it saves student self-esteem as well. For students, it allows the students to understand and adjust their behavior to comply with the direction for each. Let's talk about another strategy called no opt out. This is a strategy that does not allow students just to simply give up or not participate. So this is a sequence that begins with a student that maybe is unwilling or unable to answer a question and ends with the student giving the right answer as often as possible, even if they only repeat the answer. So students know that they can't just, you know, not do the work or not participate. So for example, if a student answered a question incorrectly, you would ask 
someone to help them. You would ask um, another student in the room. Whenever you get the right answer, you would go back to that student and have them give you the, the right answer. So um, some teacher language that you can use is something like, I'll come back to you, but I know you can do it. Or who wants to help him out? But you want to start these things, um, you know, you can start these things now in your classroom. You can also give them, I can recommend starting at the beginning of the school year. Um, and this works too whenever you have partner teachers um, that also use these same strategies. So students know what to expect, right? Um, that it's a it's a culture of achievement, not just an island of excellence. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, I think it does. So yes, uh, it, it needs to be introduced earlier in the in the beginning. Of, but and I don't want to discourage teachers um, that want to try these techniques now. Uh, the the main point is that you need to be the person to model it. You need to be explicit with what these things are and your expectations, and don't let things slide. And have the students practice as much as possible. So maybe they just um, it maybe takes a couple weeks of reinforcement, and then oh, they just continue continue yeah. to model it all year and expect it all year. Absolutely. Thank don't you. Let it, like don't let it slide. <laughs> you know, because the first time you let something slide, students pick up on that, right? Um, yes. The first time that you don't model 100%, your students are not going to start, are not going to give you 100%. Yep. And so um, this is also something that needs to be practiced, 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 practiced. In elementary school, I make it fun, you know. Um, you can make it into games, you can make it into songs, things like that. With secondary school, um, you know, it, it's, you can make it fun as well, make it into games, um, make it into contests. Um, it's just something that, is uh, non-negotiable, right? Mm, excellent. Um, There's so no opt out. Absolutely not, because you don't want kids to opt out. Up again, this is no opt out. So this is if a student says, uh, uh -oh. "Miss, I don't want to answer the question. I don't feel like it." No opt out is when uh, students are not allowed to escape from doing the work. So if Lisa is in my class and I ask her a question, she says, oh, I don't want to answer today. I don't say, oh, OK, Lisa, you don't have to have to answer. Because what happens, Lisa, if you don't have to answer? Then no one's going to think they have to answer. And that's, uh, not the, that's not the tone that you want to set in your classroom. Exactly, you want every exactly. child to feel successful. Leo, there's another question asking, is it yeah. possible to correct them when they are making mistakes? What's your thought on? Um, we're going, we'll actually talk about that here in a second. Okay, um, great. Yeah, and so you want to, yeah, we'll definitely talk about that in a second. Okay, perfect. So let's see, hopefully this works. Yay, let's see Mr. Williams use no opt out in action. So he's asking a question. The student didn't get it right. He's asking him to do it again. The teacher is still trying to walk him through the answer. And so another student's helping him out. Mm -hmm. He's going back to that student that got it wrong and he got it right. Ah, so if I don't know the answer, I can't just say I don't know, and then I put my head down and go to sleep. Absolutely you not. <laughs> I, I try. Um, uh, you as a teacher, if I didn't get it right, you would go to another student, mm -hmm. and what would that other student do? Um, and, you know, the student would hopefully get it right. If not, we would go to another student until, okay. you know, someone could get this answer right. Okay. Um, and go back to their original student. So they don't have a choice of being successful or not. They are going to be successful, even if they have to try it again and again. Okay, so, so if, if I say two plus two is five and you say no, or I don't want to answer and Lisa answers it, then I have to go back and answer the question that Lisa answered. So we both absolutely. have gotten the right answer. Absolutely. Excellent. Um, and so the, what this looks like and sounds like for teachers is that the teacher provides the answer and the student repeats it. Or maybe another student provides the answer and the first student repeats it. 
teachers can also provide clues, like you saw Mr. Williams do. You saw him writing out the word and breaking it down on the board. And the student uses these clues to find the answer. Or another student can provide the cue. And then the first student uses it to answer it correctly. For students, this means that they are not able to avoid work or participation or failure. This helps students become in, um, oh, increasingly familiar with success because they're able to answer the question correctly and more often. And so they're able to build their own success and their own confidence as a learner. So why do you think Excellent. this is beneficial for students? Because the students are uh, not able to, oh, go ahead. Sorry, yeah, I was going to say, we're time for our next poll question. Keep going. Keep yeah. reading away, please. All right. So why does this help students? And there are no right or wrong answers. I just want to hear your thoughts on this. So because the right. student is not able to avoid work or participation or failure, because the students builds their confidence as a learner, or because it shows students how never to give up. And there we go. It looks like kind of the second and third answers. Student builds confidence and it teaches students never to give up are the, the highest award winners here. Great. Um, All right, again, there, there was no right or wrong answers with that. It just depends um, you know, on your philosophy as a teacher and the students that you have. Great. Let's move on to normalizing errors. And so this kind of follows the mindset that um, I think Lisa brought up earlier, you know, what do you do if a student gets the wrong answer or something like that? Well, this follows the mindset that right is right. You want to make sure that you set and defend a high standard of correctness in your classroom. And getting it wrong and getting it right is a fundamental process of the learning process of the learning cycle, right? You want to respond to both parts of the sequence as if they were completely normal. We grow when we learn from our mistakes, both academically and personally. Wait, are you telling me it's okay to make errors when you're speaking? <laughs> Absolutely. I think oh, anyone that's I don't learning like making second. errors. I hate it. That's I keep my mouth closed if I don't because I'm afraid to make an error. Well, and I think that that's something that was maybe taught in school, right? You're afraid to make a mistake. You're afraid um, to do all these things, but that kind of fear is going to keep you back from learning, right? Uh, I'm afraid Lisa will laugh at me if I say something. Never. That's Never. <laughs> yeah, Lisa's not a bully. Um, you want to make sure that, I mean, this is definitely a, a culture in your classroom, that you don't laugh at people when they make mistakes, that everyone's learning, everyone's making mistakes, everyone's growing together. And this okay. is something that they can take with them, you know, for the rest of their lives. Let's see what this looks like in action. Okay, folks, hold with us. Uh, hopefully we'll get some sound. Eventually we'll get this worked out, but if we need to narrow it, narrate, we can narrate it. So the teach the they're taking a quiz. The teacher is telling them to put their pencils down. So students are showing their responses. Talking about a math problem. Keep narrating, we have no sound. Okay, sorry. So they're walking through the problem, mm -hmm. right? They're, they're working on a tricky math problem. And some students were getting the wrong answer in the beginning. And so they're walking through how to get to each part of the math problem. So the teacher's not saying, come see me after class, what's wrong with you? Absolutely not. They're walking through together um, how to get the right answer. Mm. And I, I noticed on the wall I'm, behind her, there's the slant on the wall as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so they're walking through how to get the right answers together. And so some people are still getting the answer wrong, but by the end of it, they're going to be able to get the answer right. Oh, great. Um, and we're going to cut this short a little bit. Um, it's definitely on the presentation for people that are interested um, there's loads of things on this on YouTube for people that are interested as well. Um, and so what does this look like and sound like for teachers? Wrong answers are a normal and healthy part of learning. And so you don't want to chastise like, oh, no, you got that wrong again, blah, blah, blah. You know, you don't want to big lecture um, with wrong answers. 
and you don't want to spend a whole lot of time talking about the wrongness. You want to get right down to fixing. And so if, and the teacher, if you notice in the beginning, she asked the, the students to give their responses. She didn't start a big lecture with the kids that got it wrong. She, she started right um, into how do you work through this math problem? And when you get the answers right, um, you want to you want to move on without a whole bunch of discussion as well, you know. Um, getting things right, getting things wrong is just how you just how you learn in, in the classroom. Um, a good statement that teachers can use in the classroom is that's incorrect. Let's do it again. For students, they experience an, an incentive to take a challenge. They're not afraid to get things wrong, right? Because they know that being wrong is okay. They're also acknowledged for their hard work and being correct but they know that wrong answers are a part of learning. This builds grit and intrinsic motivation in your students. We have a question yeah. here. So yeah, this so, comes in as well. So you can correct them and course. this is kind of the way of doing it. Well, and you don't want, I mean, you absolutely do not want to think, to have students think that their mistakes are how you're supposed to be doing something, right? Okay, you want great. to build a culture in your classroom where it's okay to get things wrong, it's okay to experiment, it's okay to grow, it's okay to learn. Um, and learning is going to mean that you get things wrong. I've gotten things wrong. Uh, Rob's gotten things wrong. Lisa's no, gotten I haven't. Wrong. <laughs> no, I haven't. Okay, well, uh, Rob, Rachel, you're wrong about that. No. Oh I'm no. <laughs> um, okay, right. just Rachel, so we know we're we're kind of running. Uh, we have uh, about 20 minutes left. We want to leave some so, questions. So open let's at the skip end. this next poll question, if that's okay with you, Rob. Sure. Um, so we can get to the last part. Is that all right? I'm going to launch it right now, and you can read it as it's being launched. Okay. So. How is normalizing errors beneficial for students? It builds grit and intrinsic motivation in students. You learn that getting it wrong is a part of learning and it art makes students not afraid to failure. I wanna hear your opinions. All right, let's see what we have. Let's share our results. What do you think, Rachel? Yeah, I mean, like I said, there is no right or wrong answers, um, but I definitely agree um, with the 39% and makes students not afraid of failure. Especially when you're teaching languages, it can be something scary for students. Um, and I think it's a great way to, to build that grit um, and that determination in your kids. Okay, great. We lost you a little bit, but if you keep uh -oh. moving forward, uh, we look good. All right. So finally, let's talk about what to do. So often when you give directions in your class, students don't actually know what to do. Kind of like pay attention. Saying, telling kids to pay attention, they do, most kids don't know what that actually means. But if you tell kids to get in slant, that's something that's demonstrable and observable that can help kids right away. So what to do? When you give directions to students, you wanna make sure that it's clear and useful guidance, that it allows students who want to, to do so easily. You wanna model and explicitly narrate what you expect students to do. And so instead of students what not to do, like stop, don't do that, quit talking, don't stop touching that, blah, 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 ne like negative statements, you want to model and give explicit directions. Like, like my examples are stop talking versus I like how student A is listening without talking. Narrate students doing right. So you want to make sure that, this, that you're getting positive reinforcement for kids that are doing the right thing. You want to spotlight those students and their on-task behaviors. And so I'm going to skip this, this video because video. we are running out of time. Yeah, well, we are kind of running out of time. So is it okay if I skip the video? What do you think? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So people can watch so, this video in, in their own spare time. Absolutely. And so the, basically the, the teacher is showing students how to separate the packet. They're not, he, she's not just saying, oh, well, get your homework out. She's saying, we're gonna get our papers out, put them on our desk, put them above our head, put our, you know, the papers in two hands and rip off the first page. And so you don't have a whole lot of distractions and wasted time. So what does this mean for teachers? It means that teachers make directions routinely useful and easy to follow. That directions are specific with a focus on manageable and precisely described actions. That they're concrete and they have clear actionable steps that any student knows how to do. And when you come across students not doing the right thing, you provide real and specific affirming and adjusting feedback about academics or character to students. So you give examples, 
you get feedback and you can practice in the moment. You don't just let things slide, you give students an opportunity to do things right. So also for teachers, these directions are sequential. They describe a sequence of actionable steps and they observe the teacher um, and you can plainly see it, right? It's not something that is just stop talking. It is, you can plainly see students quit talking and start listening. Um, and you react with speed and decisiveness if the behavior does not meet expectations. So, so often, you know, students talk in class, you want to give directions. Uh, a good statement for those kind of situations is we're ready to learn when you are listening without talking. I don't know how many kids I've had in my classroom that I've said, all right, well, I need you to pay attention or I need you to listen, but they keep talking because they think, hey, I can listen and talk at the same time. When you're giving these directions, you want to make sure that they are, are specific, measurable, and actionable. So for students, I feel like a lot of times students um, are not, you know, doing what they're asked. So they're in non-compliance because they don't know what to do actually, right? Um, they know what you're telling them not to do, but they want to be, that you need to tell students exactly what to do so they can be successful. So instead of stop doing that, it could be, I need everyone's hands on their desk without moving. Um, you know, if they're fidgeting or playing with a pencil or something, or if they're talking and you need students to listen to directions, I need everyone to listen without talking. So, because oftentimes non-compliance comes from incompetence rather than um, you know, blatant disregard for your directions. Mm -hmm. They just don't sure understand. That, yeah, absolutely. Um, they just don't understand what to actually do. Can I just ask how many, uh, when you give directions, how many directions should students have when you're talking about an assignment? Like five, ten? Oh, how many steps you usually um, should have? To be, to be completely honest, Rob, um, with the elementary school kids, I would do three mm -hmm. sequential steps. With the older kids, maybe five. I always like to to um, just break it down, right? You want to make sure that kids can can follow every little step, and that means that you can check on each child during every step, so you can okay. avoid that non-compliance and ensure that hundred percent. And so this strategy moves kids from non-compliance, you know, to not following directions, to compliance, to following your directions. Okay, great. So, how is this beneficial for students? What do you guys think? It shows students what to do instead of what not to do. It makes directions okay. routinely useful and easy to follow. Or it shows a positive behavior instead of negative behavior. What do you think? What happens if you give them too many directions, Rachel? Um, a lot of times too many directions are confusing for kids. And so even as adults, you don't want to give people too, too many directions. Um, you want to keep things short. You want to keep things measurable. You want to keep things to where you can monitor them as they proceed. And so, you know, quick directions, one, two, three directions are where kids can be successful. Okay, and anything over that, like five, six, it's, it could be too Ooh, much and they might not yeah, understand that, confusing. that they're being disrespectful to you. Very good. So uh, let's move on to our last little bit of the webinar and then see, I know Lisa's been answering some questions and if we have okay. some more, uh, we'd like to add them. That's the it. End. So the key to this, guys, is to practice, right? You want to practice, 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 because you'll get better at these techniques as a teacher, and the students will get better um, with practice as well. Uh, so uh, even if you're a veteran teacher and you've taught for many years, you, you still have to practice? Absolutely. Because just as, you know, your students are will be different every year, your practice will be different every year as well. It gets easier with okay. time, um, but... You know, everyone could be better. All right, excellent. Just so you know, I've also used these techniques as well. So I'm familiar yeah. with these and I've seen them work and I've seen them, you know, the, the teachers learn how to use them. I've seen how st uh, the students respond to them as well. So I can say these do work. Rachel, I've been teaching 27 years and it's the first time I've heard of slant. So thank you oh, for really? teaching me something. Yeah, I've not heard that. It's I expect students to be doing that in my class and teach them that, but I really have never heard the acronym. So I'm excited to know it and be able to use it and teach that directly instead of just, you know, telling them to sit up. So thanks. I learned something new today. Interesting. Well, you know, uh, Lisa is now sitting in slant right now. 
<laughs> Great. Yes. So she's optimal for paying attention. There's also other. Yeah, I'm not. It's not a hundred percent. I'm sorry. Well, then we would just have to practice, then, won't we? Um, there's yes, also other will. acronyms for it, like STAR. There's different ways to put it. Um, but when it boils down to it, it's just good behaviors that kids can take with them, right? This is how they pay attention, not just in school, but in college, in their job, wherever they go. Um, and it just shows, you know, respectful, attentive behavior. Um, thank you guys for having me today. Um, the next webinar will be presented by Ms. Lisa. Um, on the 24th of January. So make sure that you mark your calendars. These techniques And Lisa is actually our fellow in Ecuador. So not the, not me, Lisa, but uh, Lisa Pai, oh, who gosh. is in Ecuador oh. and will just be arriving to her post in the next week or so. Oh, wow. Um, Rachel, we're also gonna see if there's any questions that pop up, yeah. so don't leave yet. Um, oh, I'm, right I'm now. Not, I just want to encourage teachers to check out, you know, either on YouTube or um, online, Teach Like a Champion. And so these strategies were taken um, from, you know, top performing students and teachers from around the world. They're compiled in a book by Doug Lamar, um in a book called Teach Like a Champion. Um, he also has a lot, you know, a lot of great books from good to great, things like that. Um, I highly recommend it for any teacher. Um, or any professional that wants to really push themselves. Um, I do have a response from Luz who says, thank you very much. And then Patricia oh, says, you, I've never heard, uh, Patricia says, I've never heard of slant and I want to start creating material for my own kids and apply what I have learned today. So thanks for the tips. Oh, it's, there's so much good stuff too on Pinterest guys. And, um, you know, of course YouTube and on the internet, um, in my classroom, I had slant posters that broke down every step. And so, you know, sit up straight. I would actually take pictures of my actual students, like sitting up straight, um, you know, put them up there on the poster listening. I would take pictures of my kids, like holding their ears out. Um, there's loads of, um, materials connected with all of these ideas online. Um, and so I'm just, I'm so happy I am able to share them with you. Also, just quickly, are there any other tips that Doug Lamal has, or are these the only ones? Um, Doug Lamal has some really excellent books for not just teachers, but also professionals. And so if you're an administrator, or if you're someone that wants to work in administration, From Good to Great is an excellent book. Um, it's, you know, the title pretty much describes it from how do you get from being like a, a good person at your job to becoming a great person at your job. And also the 32 uh, strategies teach like a champion. Oh, no, 62 techniques that put your uh, students on a path to college. Um, there's there's 62 techniques um, that you can apply in your classroom that um, a lot of the schools I've worked in. That was actually what the teachers were graded on. You know, their evaluations were based off of how they are able to implement these strategies in their classroom. And so I really encourage teachers to um, check it out, you know, see what works for them, see what they think that their kids will would benefit from, take it step by step, you know, because you also will need time to practice and get good at these things. Um, and it really pushes you as a teacher, but it also pushes your students for achievement. And it teaches kids the behaviors and the mindsets and the character that they need to take with them to be successful at whatever they want to do in life. I highly recommend it. All right, Lisa, we got one more? Uh, yeah, but before we do that, just um, so many people have said, thank you, thank you, thank you. They're excited no, to try thank these. Thank you guys um, so someone... much for having me. I really appreciate you guys spending, you know, the week before Christmas. I'm sure everyone's crazy busy. Um, you know, spending an hour of your time with me, it means a lot. All right, well, one last question, and then we need to wrap it up, is what do you do if we face bad behavior when correcting a student? So in your class, what's your experience with how to deal with that, if you can oh. give one quick tip? <laughs> I, um, I would go back to the slide that talks about non-invasive techniques. And so a lot of times kids are, are they're acting up for two reasons. One, they don't know what to actually do, right? They don't understand what they're supposed to be doing. Or two, they're really desperate for that attention. And so um, I would go back to the slide that talks about non-invasive techniques. I would start with proximity. You want to get close to that kid. Uh, praise. You want to praise the students doing the right thing. Um, Nonverbal. You know, maybe, um, you know, they're talking, put your finger over, their, over your mouth, things like that. Um, and then you can move on to a private conversation. Um, a lot of times, 
you know, kids just want that attention um, or they just don't know what to do. Um, we all have challenging students in our classroom, but all of those kids can be successful if they're made to be successful. Don't give them an option of whether or not to, to, to participate or to act right in class. Um, it's just what they're, they're going to do. And with time, I know that they can get it right. Looks like we're kind of wrapping up more all this information people you can find us the Relo Andy's website you can find a lot of information on Facebook we you can find our past uh, webinars uh, from I guess going back to last year before uh, Lisa and I came down here so there's just a wealth of information you can take your time and watch these again and I'm assuming like if people watch it uh, on their own they might be able to run the videos better so if you really want to watch those videos I'm pretty sure if you run it individually in your house, it should work well. And we have one more thing for Lisa, yes? Yeah, don't forget you can download the PowerPoint from the handouts tab. So do that now, and then that way you can go back and watch those videos with the audio and really see and understand what Rachel was presenting. All right. Yeah, uh, very good. So why don't we give everyone just a second to, to do that. And uh, then, uh, so thank you very much. Uh, uh, Rachel, um, for taking your time. Uh, this yeah, is no, thank you for having me. Remote one, uh, another country. Usually it's just Lisa and I here by ourselves and so our supporting cast. But it's good to know that we can reach out to other folks. And uh, hopefully uh, in the coming months, we'll have more and more different uh, ESL fellows from around Central and South America helping out and sharing their, their wisdom with us. So uh, I want to thank everyone one more time. And hopefully everyone can now have the download watch the videos and Feliz Navidad yeah since we won't we won't talk we won't talk to you before Christmas so Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to our listening in audience we hope you enjoy your time and we'll talk to you again on the 24th, 24th of January with Lisa Pye doing a new, a new webinar and we'll let you know as time comes up but that will be so thank you very much and thank you one more time Rachel thank you okay everyone Okay, have a, have a good Christmas. Goodbye.